This is a production of Cornell University. So, um, as Adrian has mentioned, my original interest and motivation was in the well modeling of plants for. Uh, sorry, can we have this uh, spotlight out? Yeah, thank you. If the, uh, the point was to model uh, plants for uh, visual purposes, so let's say to create scenes such as this one. <laughs> no, have, have, have it down. Yeah, because there's lots of, of, of images which are quite uh, dark. Thank you. And. Uh, and the question was, well, how to generate this kind of scenery easily? So it turned out that the best way is to actually try to simulate the actual processes of plant development. And this is how I cross from computer graphics to developmental biology. And the big question is, how patterns and forms emerge in the process of development? So this is actually pretty much a fundamental question of developmental biology. And if today I would like to focus on a problem which we uh, were trying to address the most recently. And this is how uh, do forms of um, leaves emerge? And this is a problem which is particularly interesting because of the huge diversity of leaf forms in nature. Moreover, even though for us dif the difference between compound and simple leaves is uh, such a, f a fundamental one, it plays, for example, a huge role in the classification of leaves. To begin with, the question is, is it a simple, is it compound? It, it turns out that it is also a very um, labile um, feature of a leaf form, and you can see that well often even within a single uh, plant we may observe leaves of very different forms such as in this case if in uh, well in the flame tree so th those are leaves which are picked from the same uh, tree and uh, kind of seem to be uh, located there without any rhyme or reason some are multi-lobed some are simple and in this case there is no gradient to them this is another example in the silver ragwort. And over there, well, some early leaves tend to be simple, and then later ones are, well, um, well, very, very dissected. So clearly, a plant can produce this diversity quite easily. And the question is, well, can we comprehend where the diversity comes from? So. Although this would be a much more uh, kind of well nicer plan to work with if you want to understand with the progression from simple to compound leaves, but well, I don't think that Ernest is known about genetics of silver ragwort. So we started from uh, well a plant about which well something is known, namely Arabidopsis, and well so Arabidopsis is not at all the best plant for this because, well, the leaves are simple, but they have some serrations. So the question is, well, can we understand where these serrations come from? So if, well, mm, I paired up with uh, Miltos Ciantis, then at Oxford, now at Max Planck Institute in Cologne, in uh, trying to figure out what is uh, the mechanism of um, patterning of the serrations. And um, several things came uh, to picture. Probably the most important is that the serrations correspond with uh, convergence points of pin polarity. So you can see here margin of the leaf and pin proteins, which are pumping auxin, are uh, polarized in such a way that they converge in the place which coincides with the location of a uh, convergence point. And by the way, you are going to see on all the slides, or many slides, either letter O or P. O is observation. 
and P is what we postulate on the basis of uh, observations as the basis of uh, model construction which is supposed to elucidate what's going on. So this is one observation. Serrations are coinciding with uh, these convergence points. And the transport of auxin is very important because if it is impaired by NPA, we have this kind of leaf margin without serrations, and then also uh, we lose this uh, formation of convergence points. So it appeared that the key to the understanding of um, serration formation is the understanding of the action of auxin and how auxin-driven patterning uh, happens. So this is a question, how and where do uh, the convergence points emerge? So we created a model in which, which I'm going to show you. And in this model, uh, a cell is uh, represented as a square, oxygen concentration as well green square inside. Fluxes of oxygen are <coughs> represented as well uh, white lines or arrows to um, show direction. The wider the line, the, the bigger the flux. And pin concentrations are shown as bars shown in red. The wider the bar, the higher the concentration. So in 2006, if my student Albert Smith and also um, Henry Johnson, who was then a, a postdoc working at the University of California, Irvine, and collaboration with Caltech, um, came up with if the same idea of polarization, which is Pins, which are transporters of auxin, are, uh, well, as observed, are localized uh, in a polar way to some membranes. So this kind of part of interaction between auxin and pins was uh, basically by then quite well documented. But they postulated that pins are orienting themselves towards neighboring cell with the highest concentration of auxin. So the more auxin we have, the more pins are we going to have here. So the question is, first, can this kind of feedback create a pattern? So here's a simulation which is illustrating this process. We have a chain of uh, cells. And you can see this interaction in, uh, well, this feedback in action. And it results in the formation of convergence point and, well, auxin maximum. And if this happens on a longer distance, then we obtain a pattern of approximately equally spaced convergence points. So this if provides a mechanism for creating a number of convergence points in the uh, margin of the leaf. But before I um, proceed there, I wanted to uh, dwell a little bit on this model of polarization. So, <coughs> so the model of polarization which, uh, which was pro uh, proposed by Smith and Johnson, Johnson if was in a sense non-physical. It was because it was assuming that a cell knows what is the concentration of auxin in neighboring cells. And well, this violates the principle of locality. It was kind of like, well, guessing what if another cell has inside without providing a mechanism how it can be done. So this was an open question how actually it may happen. And um, well, recently, uh, my postdoc, uh, Mick Cieślak, well, um, and, and another PhD student, uh, Adam Ranion, well, came up with the idea which is um, illustrated here. So if this is actually not invalidating this mechanism of polarizing towards the cell with a uh, highest oxygen concentration, but it provides a possible me mechanical, a possible mechanical um, explanation. So the idea is if that to separate efflux and influx, and they are already separated because they are separate efflux carriers and influx carriers in the cell. So moving one more step, 
we uh, assume that the cell can measure efflux and influx separately. Um, and it is actually possible to come up with, uh, well, actually too many plausible biochemical bio uh, mechanisms for measuring uh, unidirectional fluxes. So now it turns out that if you assume that, well, on one hand, we assume that there is this presence of ox uh, oxygen efflux promoting pins. This is well, part of all theories of um, oxygen polarization going back to uh, success uh, colorization theory. If you assume that the influx has opposite effect, then we have pure canalization in the style of Sachs, which results in coordinated polarization of all pins in one way. So this is good for creating long uh, coordinated files of cells, like in the case of Venetian. If, however, we change the sign and influx also polarizes pins here, so whether oxygen flows this way or whether it flows that way, it both has the same effect of um, promoting polarization of oxygen here, then we are getting convergence points. So this provides a plausible mechanism in which a cell does not have to look into uh, uh, what happens in a different cell. It just checks what are uh, unidirectional fluxes out and in and makes the decision out of this. Uh, moreover, well, um, it can be shown that this change of sign here can be accomplished in a s uh, quite simple biochemical network by changing the rate of a single reaction, which, exp uh, which would explain why so often we see changes of polarization from one to another uh, type. OK, so one way or another, we have a mechanism for forming convergence points. And now the question is, how these convergence points are uh, emerging in the growing margin of the leaf? And here, if, well, the postulate goes actually to 19th century, where uh, when Hofmeister um, proposed, well, looking mainly at philotaxis, but <coughs> This is more general principle, at patterning processes and formulated what is known as the first variable space theory, according to which new organs are created wherever is enough space for them. So if we apply this to margin, we have the following situation. We have a leaf, small one, kind of leaf primordium, in which we have a convergence point. This convergence point actually is the one which patterned this, the position of this leaf at the first place as a part of phyllotaxis. Now this leaf grows, and then it grows, the margin expands, creating space for new convergence points. And this process con uh, continues. So as the margin goes, more and more convergence points are formed. And if you assume, according to the observation, that uh, convergence points correspond to the places where the leaf grows faster outwards, then we have, well, a plausible mechanism of, of um, um, formation of serrations. Now the question is, would this work if we put all these components into the model? So we created the model, which is shown here. So this is kind of like in the case of Arabidopsis leaf, more or less. Uh, so again, the basic idea is that, that we have a patterning process going on on the margin. And each time where convergence point is uh, formed, growth outwards is uh, accelerated and is more accelerated when concentration is higher, less when it is lower, and pattern is supposed to emerge. So will a pattern or will, will the shape of a leaf emerge from this? <coughs> so here is this process kind of with parameters more or less taken at random. You can see that patterning takes place, and so does growth. You have something like, well, let's, let's call it a generic lobed leaf. <coughs> okay. let's, check, let's change parameters a little bit. we are getting a different pattern. Now, does it correspond to a real leaf or not? <coughs> well, 
it actually happens to correspond quite closely to, I believe, and it is amazing, although again we don't have a, a molecular level data about this, how close this correspondence is, kind of lobe to lobe. This one here, this one there, this one here, 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 there. Okay? So, given that we don't uh, have this um, detailed data of ivy, well, can we make an Arabidopsis leaf? So, here I will show you this, this um, animation, which at first may look like, well, we succeeded, but I would like you to pay, to pay attention to a phenomenon which actually is drawback of the model which I'm discussing just now. Then we are going to see that some convergence points are shifting. As the leaf grows, they jump from one position to another. So let's see it. Okay, so let's look, at, let's say, at this area here. Oh, it disappeared. Okay, and here the similar situation occurs. So convergence points are formed, but they are not stable as the things grow. Now, this kind of jumping of convergence points have not really been observed in Arabidopsis, and the question is, so what is the mechanism which stabilizes oh, things there? Sorry. Here we go. So in order to see what is the source of this jumping, we should, we should re-examine the first available space theory again. Because there is an element there which is actually uh, was sort of imprecise. So here what it goes. Suppose that you have two existing organs and growth takes place, creating more space. Well, final space is sufficient to uh, introduce another organ. And one would say, and we can iterate this process forever. So again, space grows and we iterate it. The point is that it's not the only possibility. This is another possibility, that an existing if, well, kind of prototype of the organ is going to be shifted, creating space for another one. So here, also, neither nor the uh, on the left nor on the right side we have enough space, but if we can reorganize things, we create enough space. So this kind of possibility exists, but apparently is prevented in Arabidopsis, and the question is how. So here molecular data come into play again, and it turns out that convergence point is flanked by areas in which um, another protein, um, capsulate uh, cotyledons or CAC, is being expressed. And it, if on one hand, is present, on one hand, on another hand, if it is absent, so in a mutant, entire patternic process is destroyed. So um, based on this, we amended the model which I showed you, this up the gradient model, with two assumptions regarding uh, CAC. One is that CAC is absent where uh, in, in convergence points. So um, we, uh, uh, we implemented it, it is by assuming that high concentration of auxin suppresses CAC. And the second thing is that CAC is needed for pin reorientation to occur. So then our simulation becomes like this. We start in a situation where CAC is present everywhere. So CAC is represented as this um, yellow circles. And then, at the locations where uh, convergence points appear, auxin concentration increases, but this con increase of concentration of auxin eliminates CAC from there. And if you assume that presence of CAC is needed for a repolarization to occur, this convergence point now is fixed because there is no CAC there, so uh, repolarization uh, cannot occur anymore. So we have a pattern which looks at first sight similar, 
but CAC is present where oxygen is absent, and CAC is absent where oxygen <coughs> is present in high concentration. And this absence of CAC here fixes the uh, location of, uh, of primordia. There is one more element uh, to the story, namely that um, it is known that CAC overexpression makes indentation deeper. So we assumed that CAC has additional effect of suppressing growth. So we no longer have no, uh, it's a simple situation where the presence of well, oxygen maxima promotes growth. We have also a kind of well, other side of the story that presence of CAC is creating indentations. And if you put this into the model, now we have a situation here, CAC is shown as, as pink dots because yellow doesn't look uh, well enough on such a size thing. You can see that pattern occurs of indentations and uh, serrations, but now there is no jumping of, uh, um, of convergence points. So, okay, so the ability of uh, reproducing Y type was part of the story, but uh, there are also um, other um, um, elements of validation of the model. So, well, if you create pin mutant, well, it doesn't have serrations because convergence points cannot be formed. If we flood the model uh, with uh, oxen, we have the same situation as in reality, that is that again, there are no serrations formed because flooding of a uh, leaf with auxin suppresses CAC and consequently pins cannot re reorganize. Um, if we have CAC, well, the same story. In the absence of CAC, pins cannot reorganize. If we overexpress, then you have deeper serrations. So this is kind of first step in the modeling of um, if in, in the modeling of leaf shape, well, we had grand plan at the beginning from simple leaves to compound. Well, so far we have tiny step in the direction we have serrations. So can we understand well situation where uh, some lobes or compoundedness occurs? And for this, again, working with Mito Scientis and with my student uh, Adam Ranions if we turned our attention to a relative to Arabidopsis, which is Cardamine hirsuta, hirsuta. So even though it is a close relative, it, is, it has very different leaves. So this is Arabidopsis, this is uh, Cardamine hirsuta. And the question is, well, where the difference, which to our eye is a marked difference between these leaves, comes from? And well, one element of the puzzle is that it is related to the uh, well, group of uh, genes in Knox family, of which BP, which I don't dare to pronounce because it has a long name, if, if is representative. So we see that in Arabidopsis, uh, in which uh, Knox genes are not uh, expressed in the leaves, well, we have this kind of shape. If we ectopically express, express uh, BP, then we are getting almost a compound leaf. And then in Cardamine hirsuta, where uh, BP is present, uh, where, where uh, Nox uh, genes are present, we are uh, in the leaves, we are getting, well, perfectly compound leaf. Here is kind of molecular side of the story, or f first microscopic. So, um, in Cardamine, new uh, leaflets are formed in the basal part of, of the leaf. So in Arabidopsis, there's no outgrowth. And here, there is outgrowth. And if we uh, show where another uh, Nox gene, STM, is uh, expressed in uh, Cardamine, we can clearly see that it is present in this basal part of the leaf. So um, this is one part of the story regarding difference uh, between um, 
cardamine and, and uh, Arabidopsis leaves. Another element which is important is to look at veins. So if we look into cardamine leaf, we can clearly see that leaflets are growing in the directions of veins. So this is something which was absent in the model of, cardamine, uh, of Arabidopsis, which has assumed, well, there's some growth of serrations, there's accelerated growth. But because the serrations are small, in which direction they grow was not an issue. But if you have an entire lobe or entire leaflet, then in which direction it grows becomes an issue. So taking these two facts together, we created the following kind of hypothesis. First, that veins, well, present here, visible here, veins define growth axis. So it is a postulate because what we can observe is only that if growth axes are correlated with veins. Here we assume that the mechanism which patterns veins is defining direction, direction of growth. And the second thing is that NOx potentiates CAC. So basically, what NOx is, uh, what, uh, NOx is doing is, if, well, first, it amplifies the action of CAC. In particular, it amplifies this suppression of growth. So the, the reason why here these leaves occur would be due to the fact that, well, normal leaf maybe would like it like this, but CAC uh, is expressed, potentiated by NOx, makes this big indentation. And also, uh, NOx is needed for, for, for the formation of new organs to, uh, to take place. So based on this, we created a model which works as follows. Um, so here's a leaf primordium. Near the base, we have expression of NOx, shown in yellow, and, um, and CAC, and the tip Convergence point is marked by the convergence point of pin and presence of axin. Cuck, nox. Oxin promotes leaflet growth, so it becomes bigger. Cuck constrains growth, and also, uh, well, um, working together with nox, they create this narrow form at the base. However, at some point, new convergence point emerges and then growth starts there. Here further growth, uh, further uh, formation of lateral leaflets cannot uh, happen because we don't have here um, NOx or CAC. Here this dominance of uh, NOx and CAC has been broken so growth occurs and this growth is going to be in the direction of um, veins which we assume are perpendicular to the original direction. So let's see how it works in an animation or simulation. So main growth direction is established by this axis. And here at some point, um, new convergence points occurred and they grow in perpendicular direction. And this process iterates. So we are going to see subsequent um, leaflets being formed in the uh, basic petal progression. <coughs> okay, so this is comparison with, well, a young leaf of uh, cardamine. And we can see that, well, this progression of leaflets near the base was more or less captured by the model. However, the shape of the terminal leaf was not really captured. And the reason for this is that when modeling the uh, terminal leaf, we did not really incorporate vasculature there. So now the question is, well, can we increase if, um, the, the uh, very similitude, very similitude of leaves by looking at veins more closely. And in order to do this, we developed a model which actually operates at a slightly higher uh, level of abstraction. So we no longer model explicitly interaction of oxen with pins. 
we are just using the f fact that um, as a result of this interaction, new uh, convergence points can be formed at some distance. So in a sense, interaction be between pin and, and auxin is a way of measuring distances along the margin. And this process is modulated by the uh, uh, presence or absence of substances such as CAC and NOx, which can, uh, which can say that, well, even though the distances are relatively large, but because of, say, absence of CAC uh, or NOx, a new convergence point cannot appear there. So if you look at things from this perspective, we have the following basic model. So um, things are happening on the margin and within the lamina. So growth centers are formed by this distance measuring process at the margin. Um, between growth centers, so between, let's say, here and there, growth suppression can occur, which is a region where, at some distance from convergence points, where CAC is expressed. Creation of a convergence point is associated with the formation of vein. The first um, mid vein goes to the base. Subsequent mid vein, some su subsequent veins connect to the previously formed vein. And veins define growth direction. So, for example, here, growth is going to be upwards, but here is going to be well combination of this upwards coming from this vein, and lateral coming from that. And there is NOx, which is kind of amplifying the action of CAX and can be expressed, uh, let's say, in a slightly different region. So within this model, the key element of uh, growth uh, sup uh, suppression is the substance red corresponding to CAC. So that as the leaf margin expands, this CAC region is broken, and here a new convergence point is formed. So if we create this kind of model and put these elements together, just the element which I uh, described, convergence point on the margin, veins uh, connecting co convergence points to mm, into network, and this defining uh, direction of growth, and uh, growth rates and, pot um, and possibility of creating convergence points modulated by CAC and NOx, we can get, for example, this kind of growth progression. So here, is a sample simulation. So now I have kept the, the leaf kind of of a constant size on the screen. So it go, it's going to change, uh, change size because if I made it really grow, the first stages will be very small. So things can be, can be scaled. So all leaves, uh, as it, the leaf as it grows, is always scaled to the same size on the screen. Okay, and we are getting quite a plausible leaf of which, which, which is found a simple leaf, which well we could try to say whether it is leaf of a cherry or something like this, but well, reasonable generic leaf. By changing parameters of the model, we can easily change the form uh, of this leaf. So just by changing one thing, which is branching angle, we can make it looking like a ginkgo leaf. And here is, well, um, maybe more interesting fact, that if we increase <coughs> the, if, um, let's say, strength or impact of CAC, if so that it creates dip, uh, deeper um, if indentations, then we have progression from a simple to a a uh, well dissected form, or kind of um, high lobed. And moreover, you can see that there is a, a difference in the underlying architecture. So what we have here, for example, is um, there are no, uh, here there are lateral veins to the left, but not to the right. But here it appears to the right, and here we have to the right as well. And it is so because as this indentation was created, which was absent here, 
additional space has been created between con uh, convergence point as measured along the margin, and this provided with, uh, well room for well additional convergence points and additional vast, uh, uh, veins which support uh, the system. Here are some examples in which we have uh, interaction between um, CAC, shown in red, and NOx, shown in blue, which creates deeper veins. And I have an example which I would like to manipulate, but I need different glasses for this, so sorry. Okay, so what I would like to show you now is that by changing some quite intuitive parameters, we can obtain large variation of shapes. So this is basic simulation. This kind of highly lobed leaf, as shown in here. Now let us suppose that the CAC, that the impact of CAC on uh, indentation is decreased. So we are getting a, f a leaf which has simply uh, still this basic form of having three lobes, but it is much more smooth because, well, red color is not creating such a deep indentation. Now let's assume that the if impact of blue morphogen, so NOx, is uh, decreased as well. and lobes maintain competence of creating new veins. <coughs> so now we are just getting a simple leaf. And now let's suppose that the growth rates associated with veins are changed. So now we are getting <coughs> heart shaped leaf. Let's see one more example. So coming from Canada, I had to model a uh, maple leaf. <coughs> So here it comes. So you can see that there are smaller kind of indentations or which are uh, uh, due to the presence of uh, CAC and deeper ones which are due to the presence of NOx, which is kind of more sparsely located at CAC. So if you further analyze the interplay between CAC and NOx, um, we can create this kind of morphospace, which, um, okay, so here it is kind of like basic form. If we increase repression of growth by CAC, we are getting 
well mm, kind of uh, form which is which simply has uh, deeper uh, lobes if we increase it by nox we can get to the point where you have actually progress to a leaf which is compound which has three different leaflets Okay, so I could pretty much move to conclusions here, but uh, well, if um, you wouldn't mind, I would like to spend five minutes talking about something which may appear completely different, and I hope you will be surprised that actually it is not so completely different. And it is inflorescences. So this is a field of uh, well, uh, common yarrow, and this is if well kind of a picture of yarrow from the top and also diagrammatic uh, construction from which uh, representation from which one can see that actually one f uh, feature of this inflorescence and many other, uh, many other uh, inflorescences together known as corymbs is that they form a very flat surface. And this is related to the fact that they are pollinated well, uh, mainly by flies, which actually are walking on the inflorescence and pollinating flower, uh, one flower after another. So from uh, evolutionary perspective, it makes sense for this to be flat. But how this flatness can happen in nature? So here is kind of, well, more traditional point of view, which looks at inflorescences as branching structures decorated with flowers. So we have some branching structure, which is looking like this. And if we follow this idea, then the branching structure would have to grow according to quite complex trigonometric rules. Like, for example, in order to bring this flower to the same height as this one, well, this S2 would have to be S1 cosine alpha. And in order to bring this flower to the same level, well, even in two dimensions, it be, uh, the trigonometry becomes more complex. And if we imagine, if we realize that it is two-dimensional uh, well, st um, structure, well, synchronization of this growth rate to bring everything to the same level would be, well, quite a difficult trigonometric problem on which many people would have, well, mm, hard time uh, well, mm, not making mistakes. So it does not look very likely that plant is doing this trigonometry to find out to bring all flowers to the same level. So this brings us to an alternative idea in which if it is not so that uh, inflorescence is a branching structure decorated with, uh, with flowers, but flowers are being created at the same level, and then branching structure is the scaffolding was created well, um, to support these flowers. And this is the idea which is very similar to the idea of development of leaves. So in this case, in the, um, well, um, should I meristem, um, actually in the inflorescent meristem in this case, we, we have creation of a number of convergence points. Well, here I drew this in uh, two dimensions, but I will show this in three dimensions as well. And then as the structure grows, vascular connections are created in the same way, but in three dimensions, as veins in a leaf. And then in the same way in which indentations in leaf are formed, well, we have these gaps in between, and eventually we wind up with a branching structure supporting uh, all flowers at the approximately the same level. And the only thing which we have to assume here is that the growth is roughly uniform throughout the structure. So let's see whether it works. So first, we have to create, well, not a pattern of equidistant convergence points along the leaf margin, but on the surface of the uh, meristem. So here it is, using the uh, first available space algorithm, we have vascular pattern, uh, we have pattern of, uh, let's say, mm, new convergence points. But the inflorescence of yarrow is compound. So we need to go a little bit further and assume that the primordia, which are big enough, can create higher order primordia. So this is the layout of individual flowers. Actually, flower heads, because now these flower heads 
are connected into a branching structure. <coughs> so this is how it goes. Each time when a primordium appears, it is connected into a branching structure. This is a three-dimensional thing. You can look at this from, the, from underneath, and you can see how this branching structure is formed as a scaffolding supporting the flowers. So proper arrangement of flowers comes first. Scaffolding comes next. OK, so we have this kind of layout. And if we now place flowers where there the should be, we are getting this kind of model, which is shown on the right. You can compare it to the model on the left. So this is totally different ball game. We no longer have leaves. We have inflorescences. But this is the same common denominator, formation of pattern of convergence, of, uh, convergence points on the margin of the structure, whether margin of the leaf or surface of the should applicant marry stem, connection into vasculature, and its further growth. I have um, oh. um, yes, one second. I got a little bit um, have to go back. Sorry. All these things which I removed from the presentation. <laughs> OK, so I was here. Okay. So this looks like the same model, but it's actually this is not a picture. This is actual 3D model. And you can see, well, kind of like how this branching structure and, and layout of flowers looks like. But you can also see here another thing if you zoom in. So for example, you can see this here or there. What you can see is that the petals are intersecting each other. And this is something which, I using computer models, is quite difficult to avoid. But if, well, nature clearly doesn't have uh, problems with this, because as, as already Aristotle observed, in the, in the place where something is, something else cannot be. So we spend actually a substantial amount of time trying <coughs> to address this in computer models as well. And this is kind of like the well, um, current well, stage of this work. So in this case, we have employed well, um, relatively sophisticated algorithms for handling biomechanically surfaces which uh, collide with each other. And you can see that in uh, some cases, for example, in this petal, it is kind of deflected because there was another one underneath which was pushing it. The same situation is here. So we are coming closer and closer to having a real yarrow through the modeling. It is amazing that actually what, uh, where so much energy goes is how to compute these this, uh, intersections. So concluding synthesis. Growth of leaves, but not only of leaves, actually of well, um, many structures proceeds as follows. We have um, interplay between growth and form. So form is a result of growth. Growth of leaves in fluorescences is driven by pattern of convergence point on the boundary, which specify where to grow, and vasculature, which specifies in which direction to grow. There is an interplay between a uh, pattern on the boundary and vasculature, namely pattern of the boundary specifies where the veins start. And then where the veins end is determined by either the base of the structure or presence of previous veins, which explains this uh, feedback loop. Existing veins help determine where, are going to, where new veins are going to be. And then there is this loop, which is uh, Hofmeister, due to Hofmeister, that as the things are becoming bigger, they create room for new elements uh, on the boundary, new convergence points, <laughs> which are placed uh, between existing ones. And finally, as if the things grow, they can modify vasculature. And vasculature may have also uh, um, an impact on where convergence points are appearing. So this leads to something like, well, marginal, uh, uh, well um, 
conclusions, conclusion which to me actually is almost obvious, except that sometimes when I state it, well, I have a vicious opposition to the idea. And this is that mechanistic understanding of plant form from molecular level patterning to macroscopic form appears to be within the reach. We are finding more and more details and, and well, it may be so that some uh, theories which we have already will have to be replaced by others or refined, like in the case of this uh, up the gradient patterning of auxin, which is now being refined to, well, a more plausible hypothesis. But out of this, a picture uh, emerges which can actually mean that biology may be moving more and more in the direction of physics, where we have some underlying principles, and then lots of things uh, emerge from this. So um, Ernest Rutherford famously said that, well, every, well, all science is either physics or stamp collection. And it seems that, well, the development of biology is moving closer and closer to this well, um, physical <coughs> understanding of the world where we have relatively small number of general principles and a lot of things can be deduced from this. And genetic mechanisms are setting up the playground for, for these processes, but many of them have self-organizing character as shown here. So I would like to acknowledge Adam <coughs> Ranyons and Adam uh, Andrew o uh, Owens. So Adam Ranyons was the um, primary um, person behind the leaves. Andrew Owens is working on inflorescences and we are collaborating with Milton Siantis on leaves, and Regina Klassen Bockhoff from uh, well, um, Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz uh, on inflorescences. Thank you very much. <coughs> Yes, please. I'm going to ask this question based on the fact that the, um, you had a mechanism with the cells were sensing efflux and influx, that there was uh, some asymmetry. So um, based on that, I wondered if your model was second order with respect to space and time or first order with respect to space and time. Um, and why did you choose it? Okay, what do you mean by uh, first order with respect of uh, space and time and second order? So, for example, Maxwell's equations, which ah. would model your mm -hmm. um, conversion points, is second order, and the solutions are first order. But um, if you put your controls uh, um, to different, um, two different cup and box, mm -hmm. um, and had them affect the second order, you'll get an asymmetry then um, differently than if you put it in the first order solution. Yeah. So, in the so if, uh, to begin with, in the model with if, uh, in which we have um, this um, um, polarization by unidirec unidirectional fluxes, if, so um, it is des uh, described by, this, by the set of first order equations, so we don't uh, in particular uh, observe second order uh, well, um, or, um, phenomena, which would be kind of like waves propagating, um, mm. which, 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 which is related to, if, well, oscillations of this type don't, don't, don't occur, which does, don't, doesn't mean that they cannot. Second thing is that this is result is quite new. We didn't connect it with uh, CAC and NOx. We have only oxygen and PIN. Uh, well, we have only, mm, we have oxygen PIN and some network with which is uh, detecting, um, the, uh, me measuring outflux and influx. So mathematical analysis of this of this um, entire model is still to uh, to happen, but we have uh, done uh, quite an extensive uh, set of simulations showing that we have well this um, uh, convergence point formation in one case, uh, polarization. If, well, um, kind of long distance uh, polarization consistent with canalization, so uh, coordinated one in the other case, that the switch from one to another mode, uh, well, if that actually the, in the uh, um, impact of influx can be very small. So if you look into uh, the feedback loop, which is dri dri driving, well, um, the polarization of uh, pins and uh, compare the uh, mm, strengths of influence of outflux to influx, if forming a linear form so that let's say overall polarization is uh, well outflux plus alpha influx, then if alpha changes the sign, we have a change of situation from one to the another type of polarization, but alpha can be very small. 
kind of like, let's say, one thousandth of the uh, impact of outflux. So it seems that influx is this kind of, well, mm, controlling thing. So I may have not an, an answered your question uh, well directly, but I, uh, I told you what, what, uh, what we know. The results which we, we have now are basically simulation results, and we call it qualitatively understand why, it is, uh, why this sign of, uh, um, uh, why the sign of, um, uh, of uh, influence of influx causes this qualitative change in behavior. Um, but if, um, unlike previous models of oxygen, which have been mathematically analyzed quite, uh, if, um, quite extensively, this one we have not analyzed yet. We have a paper which has been accepted, and, and the main attention of reviewers was actually not on the mathematical analysis, but was on well, what kind of um, pot potential if, um, mechanism if, um, at the molecular level could be involved. And we hypothesized about this. I could entertain more discussion about this than about well, um, actual mathematical properties of, of the model. <coughs> OK? Yes? So what I find really interesting in uh, your models is that you're using relatively few variables. Uh, I mean, there's an interplay of just a less than a handful of genes that would contribute to the pathology. And I wonder if using your model, if you can look like I don't know if it's possible to go outside of the leaf that you've looked at and try to predict if, if uh, basically how close within reach are you predicting uh, uh, what we see in, in nature? Like, would that, can you tell if you're missing a character? Let's say it would be a group of species that has another gene that is in the same pathway. Can you, can you figure that out? So, um, so here it is uh, more of a hypothetical type of question. Because um, if, well, not not so much is known about well what happens, uh, let's say regarding uh, different species of uh, species of plants. What is actually known is primarily known for Arbidopsis, uh, Cardamine, and Tomato. If so, if but the models are operating if in such a way that they're, they're assuming that there are genes which are causing something. So we are abstracting rather than thinking directly in terms of genes. We are uh, thinking about uh, in terms of geometric properties, geometric patternic properties, which can be de which are dependent on these genes, and then how these geometric patternic processes result in actual patterns. So well, a, a kind of um, primary role is if, um, <coughs> in, in these models is uh, allocated to the way distances are measured, how the measurement of the distances can be m modified by substances which are uh, uh, expressed uh, on, the, on the margin, and a little bit combinatorics sort of in the, in the, sen in the sen sense of ABC model of flower development, combinatorics of this uh, morphogens on the, uh, on the margin. So it is very possible that there, is, that there are many genes which are involved, because many genes may, may have effect of increasing the distances, decreasing the distances. So, if, so um, the, the fact that we can represent these things in terms of a um, small number of, uh, of, of variables doesn't mean that a small number of genes is involved because, well, as I said, there, c there can be uh, well um, many genes ac acting in the same or similar uh, manner. But at the same time, the fact that, that such a small number of uh, parameters is involved, I think it is uh, correlated with the fact that in, in, in uh, which was my opening statement, that in nature, this change of form is very easily achievable, especially the change of form between simple and, and compound in spite of the fact that to our eye, there is a huge difference in these forms. But, f but f uh, to, to, to a plant, this is not a big deal. So I think that this is actually a sort of guiding information that if it is easy to do for na in nature, it should be also easy to do uh, well in the model. And in this, in this sense, is the fact that a that small number of parameters is uh, to me uh, kind of like, well, indirect, well, not confirmation, but a, a well, sign that we are probably maybe on, on the right path. So if, and actually, um, it is very satisfying that, that it can be so. Now, if you look, uh, everything depends on the level of detail. For example, if, if, if you look into well, um, kind of text on anatomy of leaves, or, or um, also if the, the detailed description of shape, for example, there is entire classification regarding well, what is exactly the shape of the tip? Are they like this? Are they like this? Are they like this? Or like that? And 
the, uh, well, uh, so we didn't look into this in full detail, but uh, well, our gut feeling is that those might be very much, uh, well, again, not controlled directly if, uh, by genes, but mechanical properties of, uh, of the margin and blade are controlled, result, uh, resulting in the different shapes. So, um, so th this, is, this is kind of definitely not, not, not the end of the story. We would like also to create more comprehensive morpho uh, morphospaces. I, we, we created a few of them. I showed just one. But I wouldn't say that, that I feel that we have covered the entire morphospace of our leaves. Um, but I think that it is within reach. Okay. Yes? So in your early models where you're just looking at the effect of oxen and not including nox and tuck, um, you can pretty well reproduce the, the shape of a rabbit opposite. I'm curious about the relationship between the concentration of oxen at the margins and the rate of leaf expansion, which presumably also went into your later models as well. Because if you look at the, the early leaf, the oxen concentration seems to be relatively uniform around the periphery. But as the leaf expands, it gets more localized, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things that didn't that didn't seem quite right was you saw very large gradients in oxen concentration along the margins of the leaves, but it didn't appear that there were large gradients in the rates of elongation or or expansion of the margins. So you had high concentrations of oxen in the convergence points, low in the in the valleys there, but the rates of leaf expansion between those didn't seem to vary much. Mm -hmm. Yes. So with the example of, of this Arabidopsis um, leaf is is perfect uh, perfect uh, well uh, example of this category. So if I sh uh, what, what I described is well um, a part of the story which is which was focused on the uh, action of the formation of serrations, but actually this process is uh, well su superimposed if on the assumption that there is an overall if well uh, gradient of leaf expansion. So, 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 and then, well, in, in the paper where we describe this, this, this model is described in painful detail, but this is the, this is the, the, the basic uh, part of the story, that, that, that uh, it was focusing on the f formation of additional features. Right, so you're looking at the, the additional expansion that's caused by the high oxygen concentration. In the case of Arabidopsis, and the reason for this, uh, why it may be so precisely, that is that, well, if uh, there's no NOx there, so there's not much potentiation. Once we put a NOx there, we have bigger effect, and this is what happens. Yes, please. Forgive me if I missed this. You might have mentioned it, but you have you successfully mapped the vascular architecture onto the leaf morph. So in other words, if the model has looking traditional validation, then there's got to be, or at least there should be a reasonable one-to-one -one mapping between the primary vasculature and the actual outline of, of the leaf mm -hmm. itself. Yes. So in some cases, like for example, in the case of, 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 of maple here, it is not so far uh, away. Um, in other cases, we are very far because actually we are assuming here that if, well, if from what I described, it's kind of um, evident that, that we are limited to uh, um, non-reticulate non uh, vascular systems. So open vascular systems, we don't have loops. But uh, well, uh, loops are uh, well, a very prominent uh, feature of many, many leaves. And uh, so, we, uh, so we don't have it. There is some rationale for this. According to Scarpella's model of uh, um, venation formation, even in, in the case of uh, when we have uh, loops in a leaf, veins start in the way which I described. But a little bit later on, this connection between convergence points and, and actual um, base is, uh, and, and vein is, is, is uh, well, disappears, and a vein is being formed. So even in the case of uh, leaves which have loops, initial uh, um, process is such as I described, or it seems to be. And nobody knows how actually uh, well looped um, um, venation systems are if are created. So we spent a considerable amount of time and, and well, I, I have another talk about well, Venetian patterns uh, well, uh, specifically. And we, have, we, we can create some kind of, of uh, loops. And it was already part of the first model of Michison's that he had, had some kind of uh, loops produced in, in his model of vascular pattern <coughs> formation. 
but none of these models actually is very robust or, or looks like very much like a real thing. So I would say that, well, if, if uh, we have the situation that vasculature, if we is formed initially, persists to later forms, rather than creating uh, um, close, uh, 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 reorganizing itself into closed loops, then if, well, we can see reasonable correspondence between our vascular s systems and, and reality. But when uh, uh, loops are formed, then, uh, then we don't. And I would like to, at some moment, to have this well, um, moment of, of, of uh, illumination and finding out, uh, oh, so this is how loops are formed. But it didn't happen yet. Mm -hmm. OK, let's oh. okay. One more question. We'll do one more question. Oh, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Mm -hmm. So how it seems like you can match the final form of the model to at least quite well. Yeah. So, if in the case of Arabidopsis, it looks actually um, okay. We, uh, we if, as I mentioned, basically we are just assuming th that, that, that there is some pattern of of, of uh, growth, but there is actually a sequence of uh, emergence of uh, serrations, and our model reproduces this, this sequence correctly. And th uh, so it is the case in uh, uh, well in the case of Cardamine. However, in the case of Cardamine, our model is actually that describing correctly the early uh, phases and not the later ones. And r the reason for this is that actually, um, uh, in the case of um, uh, Kadamina, you can see this long, thin segments of rekis and petiolules. And, if, and actually, it is not clear if at all what factor creates this kind of very, this kind of linear organs. So this is this is a good question, and people are looking for what gene it can be, and and well, one day there is some candidate, another day they is improved. So we assumed that there is something there, if uh, but um, it has to do with NOx, but NOx by itself is not sufficient. So so this is an example where we we can actually uh, uh, um, sort of simulate development of younger forms, but we cannot go um, farther away. And then, actually, there is uh, well, lots of uh, things which are related to the fact that in many leaves, uh, especially in trees, uh, leaves are developing initially in a form which is folded. So uh, well, the question is, to what extent the fact that it is folded and within a bat, which pro pro provides constraints, may pr provide an, uh, well, important developmental cues. So, if, so this is a, a factor to which, to some extent, we have, uh, we have been looking uh, at, and some other people have been looking at as well. But if it's the model which I have shown it here, this has not been uh, integrated. So I would say <coughs> that this is that in some cases we can capture this. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take two more things. Okay. <laughs> this has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.